welcome back. Hope you've been having a great day. I'm very excited for our second keynote address, a special Veterans Day address by former combat pilot and astronaut Mike Mullane. Uh, Colonel Mullane was named mission specialist uh, for the space shuttle and flew on three separate missions. He's also an avid mountain climber. He's going to be interviewed by legendary Bob Bazzani from CNBC. Jim, Bob, this is Mike Mullane. I thought I'd put together this video. I'm just going to self-record a Zoom session here to show you some slides, give you some background on my life story. Uh, it'll be helpful to Bob in his interview. So let me uh, go through uh, a couple slides here and give you a sense of what I did in my life. Uh, let me just go through a countdown here as if you guys were all riding with me into space. Around five hours or so before liftoff, we'll wake. Uh, we have a brief breakfast scheduled. After breakfast, we get dressed in our pressure suits. Uh, then around three hours before liftoff, we'll walk from the crew quarters, climb into the crew van, drive to the launch pad, take the elevator to the cockpit level, exit that, walk across the access arm. I'll tell you right here, your, throat, your heart is gonna be in your throat. It's gonna, it's gonna be choking you. In the white room, we dress in our harnesses, and then we get out on our hands and knees and crawl into the cockpit. There'll be technicians inside to help lay us back into our chairs. So they will strap us to those chairs. And then as they leave, they will close the side hatch, the access arm will be retracted, and we will, we will be left alone. And while we're awaiting launch, we're gonna be in the grips of two fundamental emotions, and one of which is fear. You will fear for your life while you're out there. The same time that fear is on you, you're gonna be boundlessly joyful because for most astronauts, it truly is a lifetime quest to make this flight. And with that at hand, we're gonna be overwhelmed with joy. At T minus six seconds, the three liquid engines start. Those are checked by computers, assuming that they pass all those checks. Uh, the solid, the, uh, this by the way, this is the vibrations you get in the cockpit when those engines start. At T0, the hold down bolts blow, the solid rocket boosters ignite, and we're slapped into our seats with a force of about two Gs, two times gravity as the rocket leaps from the launch pad. Two minutes up, the boosters burn out and separate. When that occurs, we hear this loud bang. We see this whip of fire across the windscreens as these things are explosively separated. Then we continue into space on the three liquid fueled engines. But from here on up, it's very smooth, very quiet. The only way you can tell you're moving really, besides looking at your instruments, are the G-forces slowly rising on your body. And those will ultimately stabilize at three Gs, three times the force of gravity. Eight and a half minutes up, the autopilot shuts off the engines. The gas tank is empty. It's jettisoned. All the remain now headed to orbit was the winged vehicle. And now we're on our way to the International Space Station, a place I never reached because I left NASA in 1990 after my third space shuttle missions and the first piece of the space station did not get launched until eight years later in 1998. I was a child of aviation very early in my life. My dad was a World War II aviator, flew as a flight engineer and top gunner on B-17 bombers in the Pacific Theater. I was 12 years old when Sputnik was launched uh, in 1957. And I was a child of the space race and I knew what I wanted to be. I wanted to be an astronaut. I wanted to be one of these guys, John Glenn or Alan Shepard. I was growing up in Albuquerque, New Mexico, a vast desert right outside my door where I can indulge my interest in homemade rocketry. I tell you, it wasn't so much rocketry as pipe bombs with fins. Amazing I didn't kill myself in this era. Uh, here I am setting up one of my creations for launch. Here I am legging it, out after, legging it out after lighting a fuse. By the way, this is called hazard mitigation teenager style. This is my science fair project from 1960. I was a sophomore in high school. Uh, this was on how rockets might one day parachute back to Earth from space. I had to write a report for this project. I want to share with you the first two sentences of this report because it's pretty, pretty incredible when you read them. Okay, I'm writing this as a sophomore, 14 years old, in uh, 1960. Uh, today, 1960, in 1960, this country and many others throughout the world are steadily working toward the conquest of space. Okay, my second sentence in that report read, Someday, I also plan to participate in this great undertaking. I was 14 years old when I wrote that, and then 25 years later, age 39, I'm on my rookie space shuttle mission aboard Discovery. So clearly, I had a dream come true at, uh, in, a, in a magnitude one uh, uh, accomplishment there, or dream, dream fulfillment. Uh, this, by the way, many people hearing that will assume that I was some type of super kid, super child destined for greatness, a genius child, all these things you might imagine for somebody that had a dream come true like this. I tell you, that's not true. I was a very ordinary kid and I could prove it with these slides from my youth. 
this is my senior high school yearbook entry and got an ambition. I wanted to attend the Air Force Academy. I couldn't get into the Air Force Academy. My grades weren't good enough. My SAT scores weren't high enough. West Point, the Army Academy took me, which doesn't say a lot about West Point, but in all fairness to West Point, I was a third alternate for my congressional district. I barely made it into West Point and at graduation of West Point, I wasn't on the stage getting awards for academic excellence. So get it out of your mind that I was some type of genius child or lavishly talented, I was not. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Bob Pisani here. Uh, Mike, that was a wonderful series of slides. Uh, you may not have been a genius, but you were a 14 year old. It's very few people that get to say, I, at 14, what you want to do, and actually ended up doing that. So, so congratulations. Um, today's Veterans Day, Mike, and uh, of course, it's good to honor our veterans, including you. You were an Air Force Colonel and a weapons system operator in Vietnam. Tell us very briefly about that experience in Vietnam and, and how it molded your personality. Okay, I was, in, I was in Vietnam in 1969, 23, year, 23 years old. Uh, I was a uh, backseater in the F-4 Phantom, the Mach 2 jet, uh, fighter jet, but it was a uh, fighter version of that had been modified into a reconnaissance jet, a tactical reconnaissance jet. So our mission was to fly very high speed, low level over enemy targets, taking pre-strike and post-strike photography uh, for the intelligence community to use in their uh, targeting. Uh, did that for uh, 134 combat missions and then continued my Air Force career uh, beyond that. As far as how it changed me, uh, it certainly opened my eyes to the reality of war. Uh, we lost pilots, we lost uh, planes, so it certainly uh, did did have a, a big impact on me. Yeah, I can imagine. So, uh, going by outside my, my door here, uh, you, <laughs> three missions, I believe, in the, uh, the space shuttle mission, uh, 84, 88, and 1990. Right. And can you tell us a little bit about what you were doing, what the purpose of the mission and, and what your the experience was like being in space? The slides and the, the, the movies are very interesting. But did you get that, you know, the moment all many astronauts talk about looking down at the Earth, um, you know, and realize like we're just a little dot in the universe? Did you have any metaphysical moments, I guess, is the question. <laughs> Well, let me tell you first, I'll answer that question, but let me tell you first what I did on my three missions. Uh, my first mission, I was lucky enough to fly on the very first flight of the Orbiter Discovery. Now that Orbiter, if anybody wants to check it out, is in the Udvar Hazy uh, Air and Space Smithsonian Annex up in Washington, DC. I made uh, the first, I was aboard that for its very first flight. Uh, we had three communication satellites uh, that, we, that we released on that and a, and a solar array experiment. Uh, my second mission, I was in, uh, the first mission was a 12 shuttle mission. The second mission was the second mission after the Challenger disaster in 1988. Uh, and that was a military mission. Can't talk about the payload. All I can say is I used the robot arm to release a uh, military satellite. My third mission was another military mission and I can't say anything about that. As far as uh, having metaphysical out of body experiences looking down at the earth, I. I think the biggest effect on me uh, from a psychological point of view was the fact I was realizing a life dream. So that just overwhelmed me when I looked down, particularly when I looked down at the same desert where as a child I was launching those rockets there near Albuquerque. And now I'm up at you know, 250 miles looking down on that exact spot. Uh, that completion of this dream just, just filled me with such an immense sense of joy. But to your point, you look out that window of the of the uh, at the Earth. It is incredibly beautiful. It is. I I was shocked. I had seen so many photos, heard so many descriptions. I felt I was prepared for for that. But emotionally, you can't prepare yourself for the incredible beauty of the Earth from that altitude. Now we're relatively close to the Earth. It fills the windows. We can see that it's curved, but we don't see it as a blue ball as the Apollo astronauts did. So I didn't have that that sense that I was totally disconnected from the earth as I've heard other astronauts describe uh, who are going to the moon. And I'm certain when you go to Mars, you're really gonna feel disconnected from, from earth. Yeah, how about the physical part of all that? So you're sitting on a giant explosive rocket, literally an explosive rocket. But what happens, to you? do your insides shake? I mean, what is, what is, what's the physical sensation of actually the lift off like? Well, obviously there's a heightened sense of fear when you get down to those final seconds flickering off the, off the countdown clock. When the engines start, you get a heavy vibration in the cockpit 
at T0, you really get kind of slammed with the, the liftoff in the sense that it's two Gs on your body just like that, or almost two Gs. So you know you're on your way at that point. There's a lot of shaking and rattling for about two minutes. And then when those boosters separate, you hear that loud bang, you see this fire across the windscreens. These things are pyrotechnically separated. And then like a light switch, it just gets dead quiet, no noise, no vibration. For another six and a half minutes, we continue into space on those liquid engines, but you're above the atmosphere, so there's no shock waves shaking you. The boosters are gone, so you don't have the noise and vibration of those. And it's just this electric ride from then on, just a silent electric ride with a G4. I say electric because that's what it's like, no sound or, or vibrations, but you get the G forces building on your body and they'll stabilize at three Gs. And then when the engines quit eight and a half minutes up, that's at about 90 miles altitude. You're coasting higher, of course. And uh, yeah, that's it. immediately you go from three G's, engine stop, and now you're weightless. It's an amazing, amazing transition uh, to go through that in just eight and a half minutes. Yeah, it's, it's an incredible journey here. I, I, one of the people who wants to do this for space tourists, of course, is uh, Jeff Bezos in Blue Origin. I'm wondering how you feel about the, this push towards uh, privatization in space. This was you know, a dream 10 years ago. Now we've got Blue Origin with, with uh, Jeff Bezos. We've got Virgin Galactic with Richard Branson. We've got SpaceX with Elon Musk, all slightly different, but essentially it's moving towards uh, privatization of space. How, how do you feel about that? This is a good thing. And how do you think NASA feels about it? Well, I, I personally, when they first announced uh, back in 2010 that we were going to private, NASA was going to privatize low Earth orbit, uh, turn that operation over to these private companies and they would just lease the services of these private companies when NASA wanted to launch their own astronauts. When I heard that, I thought it was nuts. I thought it was crazy. I thought it was doomed to failure. And, and I'm reflecting the attitude, I think, that most astronauts, if not all astronauts felt. Some astronauts wrote a, uh, uh, some NASA legends wrote a letter to President Obama predicting this was a disaster. It was the end of the manned space flight as, as being leaders in space flight for the United States. And I have come 180 degrees on this. I am so excited about what I see with these startup companies, how fast they've moved, uh, what they've done. I, I have, I've come, I'm a convert. I am so glad to see capitalism has been brought to bear in the low earth orbit, low earth orbit market. And uh, all of these wonderful things that are happening with uh, a much faster pace with the reusability of the rockets. So I'm a convert, I'm all for it. You know, I, I am too. Um, my impression here is that private efforts are a lot more nimble and NASA is a little more bureaucratic. I don't, that sounds like I'm being critical of NASA, but I wonder if you could address that. I mean, there's a lot of people out there in NASA who's got careers, you know, bound up in, you know, those big rockets that, that Musk is basically saying, I can do cheaper and, and, and faster. I, I believe that he can. Um, but is that, is that somehow an existential threat to NASA in some way? Well, uh, certainly low Earth orbit has been surrendered to the uh, to the private companies. Uh, uh, but as part of that plan, when it was made to 2010, that NASA, under the old model of building these rockets in house and owning the rockets and the infrastructure, that was uh, at that point, that was the model for a super moon rocket that NASA is working on right now called the SLS, SLS Space Launch System. Uh, that's what's going to take the Orion capsule back to the moon, land people on the moon, ultimately take us to Mars. So NASA has been working on that for a long time, this super moon rocket uh, under the old model. And and uh, I've talked to people there that are working on that, and they are very afraid that uh, Elon Musk in particular is going to cut their legs out at the last minute because obviously if Elon Musk starts launching his super heavy rocket and sending tourists. And I, I know he's planning well, uh, here in the next couple of years of sending a, a billionaire Asian uh, tourist uh, a flight around the moon and then back to Earth. It won't land on the moon, but uh, they worry that if, Na if he's up there first with these super large rockets, that Congress is going to look to NASA and say, well, why are we uh, paying you guys billions of dollars to develop a rocket that Musk already has operating and you can just lease that one? They do yeah. worry that whole careers will be uh, will be for naught if that happens. Yeah, I don't blame them. Um, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the future of manned exploration. I, you know, I grew up as a kid reading science fiction in the 1960s, Robert Heinlein and Isaac Asimov and Arthur C. Clarke. They were all my heroes. And of course, there was a, a lot of that stuff was a space opera, you know, cowboys and space kind of thing. But I wonder... Uh, it, 
we've had to face to the, face up to the harsh realities of being in space, just the radiation uh, that's involved. Uh, and I'm wondering how you feel about um, manned exploration to Mars. I mean, it seems like a tough proposition. Life is pretty inhospitable on the Earth. It's hard for a carbon-based life form <laughs> to survive out there. Do you, first, it, it is. Question, do you think we have we could get to Mars in the next 20 years? But what's the real future for humans in space? Can we actually really realistically do that? I mean, can we go to Alpha Centauri, which is the nearest star system? It's only four light years away, but that seems like a pretty daunting proposition for a human, maybe yeah. for a robot, maybe if we download into a silicon-based life form or something like that. Just address that for a minute. Well, going to Mars, uh, going to Alpha Centauri, uh, I'll address that first. Uh, unless we find those dilithium crystals from that UFO crash in 1947, <laughs> and that is a joke, folks. I don't believe we're hiding any any wreckage from a, a UFO crash. But jokingly, uh, uh, the dilithium crystals there. But the reality is, is uh, flying those distances, I, I can't imagine. Uh, when that'll occur, if ever it will occur. Now, getting to Mars is definitely within our reach. It's going to be very expensive. It's going to take a while. Uh, 20 years, uh, NASA is hoping to do it by 2040. So that's right in their their uh, timeline. Uh, probably probably going to be later than that. But it's incredibly difficult uh, when you start sending people those distances because everything they need has to be aboard that spacecraft. Uh, just everything you touch today, you need it basically about three years worth for a round trip to Mars. I'm talking food, oxygen, water, toilet paper, uh, everything uh, for three years has to go along with you. And that is a very challenging task logistically. And to your point, what about the human, uh, the radiation that you're exposed to? If there could be solar flare, you could take a lethal dose of uh, radiation. So there has to be a place where these astronauts can be guarded against something like that happening. So there's a there's a huge uh, a lot of unknowns associated with getting to Mars, and that is why NASA has taken the baby steps with this space station, and then going back and put it. They want to put a mini space station in orbit at, at the distance of the moon's orbit uh, to get them some experience at being more separated from the Earth uh, before they take that leap into uh, leap to Mars. But it's a very very a lot of tough tough nuts have to be cracked to be able to pull that off. But just to go back to the question, do you think we could do this? Do you think in 2040, we'll have somebody on Mars? 20 years. Uh, boy, I tell you, you can get in trouble making predictions like this. I I will be surprised if they're able to have humans on Mars by 2040, uh, but maybe, maybe. Uh, it's certainly within the realm of possibility. It all boils, boils down to money. All of these problems can be solved with money. Yeah. And, if for some reason the country wanted to embark on a uh, space race type of effort like we did to get uh, beat the Russians to the moon, yes, that could definitely happen. It's just a matter of money. And you that, of course, goes to the national will. Space race. I'll, I'll pick up on that. Um, how do you feel about the Chinese uh, entering space or the Russians? Um, are, are they more advanced than we are? Do they have an Elon Musk or do we want international cooperation? What do we want in space? Well, uh, Russia has been a long-term partner on uh, the, the space station. Uh, if we go to Mars, I'm uh, sure they will be participants in that. Well, unless there's some geopolitical issue that, that gets in the way, they will be uh, partners on going to Mars, as will the Europeans be. So well, we won't get to Mars by, you know, it won't just be the United States as it was with the Apollo program. It's definitely going to be an international uh, program. Now, as far as the Chinese go, whether they're going to be participating in it, uh, over that time span, I think a lot of geopolitical issues are gonna to have to be settled before they're welcome aboard it. Um, but certainly Russia, unless something really-, really and, and down the Russian, It'll be international go to Mars because we don't have the money or the technology. Why will it be an international? Well, it'll be international because uh, we're spreading the uh, pain of the expense around, uh, giving other, everybody else a chance to throw their uh, dollars and rubles and, uh, and pounds at it to, to, yeah. to get it done, yeah. it's an expensive. Now, could the United States do it? Sure, we could do it. Absolutely, yeah. we could do it. Uh, if, if we embarked on some, uh, say, hey, we're going to do it alone, and we're going to get to Mars before anybody else, and the national will is there, and Congress allocates the money. Look, I gotta, we got we to wrap this, but uh, before I let you go, let me ask you the big picture question. Uh, how do you feel about life in the universe? Is is it there, or is it, uh, like uh, Enrico Fermi said, where is everybody, and um, maybe we're alone? Quick answer. Well, the, I get 
given the enormity of the universe, the trillions of stars and the planets, uh, the number of planets that they're finding that could be habitable, uh, I personally believe there's going to be alien life out there. And I think, think some of it will be uh, intelligent alien life, but I don't believe it's visited the earth. I just don't believe any UFOs are landing and uh, aliens are walking amongst us, that type of thing. Yeah, I don't either. Although um, I, I, sometimes I wish there were. Um, maybe it would help us <laughs> all a lot to understand where we are. <laughs> in I'm going to have to leave it there. Mike Mullane, it's been a pleasure meeting you and getting to know you yesterday and spending some time with you. I really appreciate it. Thank you for your service to the country. And by the way, if you want to read more about Mike, he's got a great book out, Riding Rockets, The Outrageous Tales of a Space Shuttle Astronaut. You can get that on Amazon and at your favorite bookstores. Mike, again, thanks very much. And I'm going to turn it back over to the moderators for our Spark Thank you, conference. Thank you, Mike. And thank you, everybody, for joining us.